Welcome to the Rent to Retirement Podcast, your resource for passive real estate investing and retirement strategies. If you're new to real estate or planning your financial future, you're in the right place. Join us at renttoretirement.com to find your path to financial freedom and an easy, carefree retirement. Enjoy the show. This is your host, Zach Lee Master, here with my co-host, Sam Hack. Hey, Zach. Good to be here. Um, today's interview was really um, inspiring. Ian was a really cool guest and was proving that, that you can live anywhere if uh, you invest properly and you can, you know, create that wealth for yourself in a long distance manner. So, um, yeah, some really good mindset uh, points that he touched on and uh, getting comfortable with the turnkey space and getting outside your comfort zone. I love it. Yeah, Ian brought up a lot of really good points and nuggets of knowledge that we're excited to share with everyone. He's a New York-based investor living in Manhattan, one of the most expensive markets there is. Let's go ahead and dive right into it. Thank you for listening to the Rent Retirement Podcast. Today, we have an investor, our guest, Ian, with us, who is currently located in Manhattan. He's been very limited to invest in real estate locally, obviously, due to the taxes and real estate prices, legislation, all the above. And so that's why he's looking to invest with us. He is currently closed on one uh, turnkey deal with rent retirement in Kansas City and also under contract for another one right now. So, Ian, thank you for taking some time to join us. Welcome to the show. Um, let's go ahead and get started by you just telling us a little bit about yourself and in your background. Sure. So um, I was born and raised here in New York City. I went to high school here. I spent spent a few years in Dominican Republic, so I got a I got a I spent like four years out there when I, in my childhood. So got a mix of both. Um, but born and raised here for the most part. I work in as a video editor, video producer um, for a multimedia company that I will not name. <laughs> um, and this is, you know, I guess this is the beginning of my investment journey so far. Can you tell us real quick, um, the first turnkey you bought with us earlier, is this, was this your first kind of endeavor into real estate or do you have a background in real estate and kind of what, what led up to that first investment? So this was, um, I guess my first investment period. I don't even own a home. So <laughs> that's probably, that was actually the first home I've ever bought. Um, and the first investment I've ever made when it comes to real estate. So I've done, you know, some, some investment in stocks and stuff like that, but nothing, nothing, um, tangible or concrete that you can touch. So this was my first investment. I got into it. Um, I got into real estate. I want to say like two years ago, started looking into different options, um, to invest in, uh, just cause I was, Honestly, at the at the beginning, I was looking into purchasing a home and didn't really like the fact that I was going to be stuck with a loan. Um, and then kind of that just kind of trickled in and went down the rabbit hole of different types of investments. Um, eventually was going to go into um, syndications and later found out that you needed to um, be an accredited investor. That kind of backed me off a bit, and then I landed on turnkey properties. I heard about the term turnkey, um, but didn't know much about it, and then I started looking on bigger pockets, and I actually found Rental Retirement on there. So that's kind of how I landed here. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I'm uh, myself in an expensive market out here in Jackson Hole, and uh, I'm from upstate New York originally, so I totally feel that like anxiety, like, oh my gosh, when, how am I ever going to be able to afford anything, a primary residence or investment property? So the, the turnkey space and reading a couple books about the long distance feasibility of real estate was really eye-opening. Would you say that's like the main motivator for why you got into this, or what are those other reasons uh, you decided to I, do it? So I think in my case, I've been doing my job for about eight years. I usually go into things and spend a few years in them, and then I kind of move out to another space. So in this case, I guess I was doing that when I was younger. I used to hack iPhones. I, I did photography. I did wedding photography for a bit. And then I've been doing video producing, mostly video editing. Um, and that's been going well. All, all of those things went well. I just get bored after a while <laughs> and then I kind of need to move on. It's this weird thing, but I, I do, I still, I'm still passionate about those things. It's just, 
I guess in this case, I was just kind of like, all right, this is um, this is something I've been doing for a while. Is there anything else I can look into? Then didn't know because I was making good money as well. It's kind of my career. <laughs> so um, after a while, just thinking and being like, all right, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Then I kind of went down this other rabbit hole of like, what careers can I choose, right? And eventually I was like, wait, why don't I just look into what I can do with this money for now? So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I'm kind of in a, in a space where I got into real estate because I had enough cash to do it, but I also still have, you know, still have my day job, which I need to depend on for the most part. It's more of a thing of being able to do whatever I want with my time and kind of, um, I guess, give back in a way. That's that's one of my biggest things, you know, give back, um, spend time with family whenever I want to mm. and enjoy life in a way that doesn't have any boundaries like my nine, my my 10 to six. So you're not going to get bored of uh, real estate investing in a year or two and sell it and call it quits? <laughs> <laughs> um, since I guess that's why I got into the turnkey, right? It's not something where I have to be on top of it every single day, but it's enough to um, enough where where I you know every so often you get a call or you have to do something, but not where not where you're just like this is my day job, this is where I'm at, and I'm handling calls 24/7. You know. Yeah, very cool. Um, let's kind of dive into that a little bit deeper, Ian, because you have a little bit of a different approach than a lot of people we've talked to that are very strict, like you know real estate. I want to replace my income. I want to you know retire. I want you know financial independence or build this this large net worth. It almost seems like to you this is this is something that you just were interested in and you wanted to kind of try out and, and get kind of a fundamental experience with. Um, and you talked about investing in stocks and other sort of asset classes and doing some different stuff. What what was it about real estate that kind of was like, oh, I, I want to try this out? What was the initial kind of leading factor into making you want to pursue it, invest in real estate? And, and what do you think the benefits are compared to some of these other investments you've made historically? I still have some of those reasons, right? Just like other investors, I want to grow, you know, I want to grow my net worth. I want to do all these things. But when it comes down to real estate, right, you can look at stocks and you can play that game, right? Where you're just waiting, 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 waiting. I think with real estate, it allows you to not only invest, but it allows you to also then make decisions on those investments in a way that maybe an index fund or anything like that doesn't. And on top of that, I guess, some of it is the fact that it's a tangible asset, right? It's not out, out in the ether or something like that. Um, it's nice to be like, oh, this is the home, this is that, right? It's something that's been around for longer than I would say stocks. So that was another part of the decision. I was like, if I'm going to invest in something, I need to know that it's something that's going to be around a thousand years from now, right? I'm not going to be around in a thousand years, but I, I know that times change and when I look back at things, I was just like, everyone I know needs a home, right? <laughs> you know, I was weighing the pros and the cons, and I noticed that with stocks, right, you're watching, you're watching them appreciate, um, but there's nothing else to them. It's just assets appreciating. With with a home, you have, you know, you have the cash flow, you have the fact that um, use the appreciation later on, the tax breaks. It's a lot of things. It's a lot of different factors. And while the entry point is higher, you're climbing a bigger step. But then once you climb that bigger step, you can basically see so much more than if you just invest in stocks and you're just like, all right, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And then I'm 50, 55. And now is that I start, you know, I don't know. That's the that's the biggest difference to me. I don't do any other investing outside of, of real estate, but it's been a proven path. But for all the same reasons that you just mentioned, real estate is, is tangible. You're providing a service to people. You know, you're you're able to, you know, build your wealth. I think much greater through all the benefits of real estate that it offers. Not only just the cash flow, income, the appreciation, debt pay down, tax benefits, depreciation. You get leverage. You know, if you had twenty thousand dollars to invest and you put that into stocks, and that stock went up five percent that year, now you have twenty one thousand, a net gain of a thousand dollars, but a five percent return. Whereas if you use that $20,000 and leverage a $100,000 house and that $100,000 house goes up 
5% that year. Now you have $5,000 of equity. That's a 25% return on your money. So the numbers really speak for themselves. Um, and I think you can really be creative. You, you have a little bit more control. Like you said, real estate's been around forever. Um, you know, prostitution and landlord <laughs> oldest, you know, profession. <laughs> so definitely, definitely. <laughs> and, and I, I love that perspective too, from, a um, uh, someone in New York City because like nobody owns anything there, right? You pay rent, yeah. you get an Uber, <laughs> you, you ride a city bike, you don't own anything because it's such a sharing economy. But I love that you're able to think outside the box. It's such an important thing, even if you can't do it locally. Yeah, definitely. Going back to that, right? It's, I, I've, I think that's also something, um, live in New York City because nobody owns or anything like that. Um, that was a really big factor for me because I was, I started looking in New York City, right? And eventually I go, wait, you've got to have $300,000 saved up just to be able to buy a property. And then on top of that, some of these HOAs out here are a thousand and up, right? So you're paying for the property. Then after you've saved up all that money, then you're paying HOAs, all these things, right? And then you start looking further out. And then, you know, to get something decent, you're what you got to be willing to spend 300 grand, you know, or, or, or $300,000 house for maybe a two bedroom, right? Um, it just didn't make sense, right? And then I guess, you know, I looked at my lifestyle. Um, my income has gone up substantially since I was younger, but it got to the point where I was like, all right, either I can go and buy a house or I can stay in this apartment and, save up and build up for maybe five, six years, right? And then I see what I can do from there. But I, I do know a lot of people, right, that once they once they start making a good amount of money after they come out of college most times, right, they go into this, all right, now I got to buy a house. Now I got to buy a car. Now I got to do this, right? And eventually they're in debt. And that's kind of what I looked at, right? I was like, all right, if I'm going down this path, I'm going to have a house, I'm going to have a car, I'm going to have all these things, but I'm just locking myself up even more. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense to provide housing for someone else and keep renting in New yeah. York City, <laughs> have someone else pay your rent with the cash flow. Let's talk about, you know, kind of the properties that, that you own now um, and that you're purchasing. Let's talk about, you know, the specifics in terms of numbers, anticipated cash flow returns. Let's talk about some of the things that Rent Retirement is able to help you with from a comprehensive approach as well as some obstacles that you had throughout that process. We put down, I believe in May, we put down 20 something thousand dollars on a property back in Missouri. That property has been cash flowing the entire time. So far, there haven't been any repairs or anything that's been needed. So that's been awesome. And the tenants have been awesome as well. We haven't missed one payment. Like you said, we're working with, um, with John out there in Kansas City. His team's been awesome. I think that's another another important factor, right? When when it comes down to it, the management teams that are in place um, really make or break whether or not you feel comfortable, you know, on a month to month basis. So we've been working with John out there and his team. It's been amazing. Um, any questions I've had, they've answered it. Aside from that, that process was honestly, I, I, let me backtrack a bit. We were going to buy a, a property in Kansas City. Something happened with the plumbing, not due to rent or retirement or anything, but just something happened with the city. And the basement of that property flooded. The city was like, we can fix it. And then John showed me another property. And this is the property I'm in now. So even though we had that hiccup, John immediately moved me on to another property that was actually better, um, ironically. And so that's the property that's been cash flowing. After that, um, I went and was about to pro purchase a property in Ohio, but that, that property is specifically I didn't feel comfortable with. After the inspection, um, we ended up pulling out. Zach was great and just being like, I have your back. Um, just cause as a new investor, you're a little, you know, you're, you're, you're talking to all these people. You don't want, in a way, you don't want to let anyone down, but it's also your money. So you have to, you know, you kind of have to be like, all right, if this is what I want to do, then do it. But the fact that when I reached out to Zach and he was just like, listen, we do what you want to do. This is what we're here for. That just gave me the confidence to, I mean, this was maybe three days after that. 
uh, Scott sent me a property in, in Illinois and we locked it up immediately. So right now we're, we should be closing at the end of January. That one's already got a tenant in it. So it's just a matter of, you know, purchasing the property and going through the paperwork. So hopefully, you know, that all goes smooth. I'm sure it will, but that's where we're at now. I had a similar experience when I was looking at buying my first property and it was in Syracuse, New York, and we did the inspection and it came back and it was like, man, this is really a pit. You know, it's a pig with lipstick on it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, at least you're in the trenches. At least you, you, you know, you have it under contract. You're getting inspection on it and that's taking action in and of itself. You don't have to, you know, pull the trigger on the first property you get under contract. So it's good to kind of get your toes in the water regardless. Um, but not, you know, not make a big financial mistake. So I totally, See where you're coming yeah, from definitely. with that. You know, when you go into it as a newbie, right? Mm-hmm. You go into it and you put down the moment that you decide, right? That you're, that you reach out to Zach and your, and the team and you go, Hey, I'm purchasing this property. At the beginning, your worry is, Oh, wow, I just put down this amount of money. But in reality, until you don't go through all the checkpoints, you haven't really purchased the property. Mm-hmm. So I think to mm-hmm. anyone out there, right? Who's a little bit timid about, you know, putting down the money, I would say once you choose a property, you're going to go through a process that's going to make you feel more comfortable about putting down that money. So don't hesitate to just be aggressive with the decision that you're trying to make. Real estate isn't something that you're only signing one paper and going, here's the property. There's a bunch of steps in between, but by the end of it, you should feel comfortable enough to make a decision. You brought up a lot of really good points in, in that it can be absolutely daunting when you're putting a lot of money down on a property. You know, it's by no means just chump change. You know, you're, you're talking thousands of dollars and, and, you know, leveraging hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes. I always view real estate as a, as a holding place for money. You definitely don't want to be buying something that, you know, potentially could be a money pit. Um, but when it's a stable rental, I look at these things as just placing money, you know, just like you would in a CD or something. Real estate's still liquid. You can still, if you needed to get that money out of it, you can, you know, sell the property and liquidate those funds. Ideally, down the road, that house would be worth more through appreciation. You know, it would have been producing income during that time that you owned it. The tenant would have been paying the loan down, so you would have actually, you know, had had equity built in it over time. But a lot of people think that even if you have the idea of going in and building a long-term portfolio and holding holding these things for 30 years, Real estate is, is still dynamic. It's still liquid. It's a holding place for money, you know, and as long as you're investing for good fundamentals and the, the house is positive cash flow and supporting it's, itself. The other point I really like that you mentioned is that you're not, you're not buying it day one, right? When you sign a contract, because a lot of people are very hesitant about signing a contract on a property. They think they're locked in and there's no way, yeah. you know, you have contingencies. I always tell people, this is a typical real estate transaction. We're going to walk you through this as part of the educational piece, going, actually going through it. You have your contingencies for appraisal, inspection, and financing. When you sign a contract on a property, you're getting control over it. You want to do that. If something meets your fundamental criteria, you want to do that as quickly as possible. That way you can have control over the property, and then you go through. You have so much time to go through and meticulously nitpick the property. The bank is partnering with you. They're your majority partner putting 80% in. They're going to make sure that they're not lending their money out on a crap old property that's over. They need to make sure with the appraisal it's priced appropriately for the market. They want to make sure that the home is in the condition that is going to be productive for rental, um, rental income over time. And so, yeah, you go through all these checks and balances. And then once you're 100% sure on that and you've fully evaluated everything, that's when you go to the closing table and put the money down. So I just want to say I appreciate you brought up a couple of really good points there. Get rich slow scheme. That's what I always say. It's like, yeah, <laughs> and there's no, I mean, there's no drastic wake up the next day and you've made it. I don't know anyone that's that, you know, that happens to. And when they do, it's like winning the lottery and then they lose all the money the next week. Right. So yeah. it's really that, like um, gradual progression that you become the person you want to be. It just, it's a little by little. I, I like that perspective a lot. It's so important. Yeah, and if you can't, I, I've read this somewhere, but it's like if you can't manage a thousand dollars, how can you manage a hundred thousand? And yeah. it's kind of right. You you build it up little by little. You know, at first I was like, oh, can I drop twenty thousand dollars on this? Right? How do I feel about it? Now dropping the twenty thousand dollars, I'm not thinking about the fact that I'm losing twenty thousand dollars. I'm thinking about the fact that I'm gaining money. So it's very different, right? And and until you don't do it you don't really get that feeling or you don't, you don't really understand that. But once you do it, then it's like, all right, well, let's do this again. That 20,000 didn't disappear. You know, it's just, no. now it's working for you. You know, in real estate, 
Investing is not complicated, but to your point, it takes consistent action. It just takes daily action again and again and again. Some people lose motivation, you know, over time, and that, that's okay. That happens, but really to ultimately get to that financial independence, you just got to really stay the course for a long enough period of time, buy enough, buy enough houses, you know what I mean? So, Ian, I just really appreciate you taking some time out to, to join us um, today. You covered a lot of very interesting topics. I think people are going to find very educational. Really appreciate your time. Um, I think covering the just the mindset part of what you've talked a lot about has, has been crucial, and that's really what it boils down to. So anyways, really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us, and we'll connect with you in a couple of years when you, you know, have 500 doors and interview. <laughs> yeah. It's been great being here, guys. It's, you know, at the end of the day, um, I think we're doing this because, you know, we're passionate about something. So it's all that matters. Thanks. <laughs>
Um, so then I decided, hey, this is actually a pretty good idea. Why don't I try this doing the same thing? And then I realized I was pretty much priced out of the market because I couldn't afford anything out here. Um, but yeah, I still do manage that property right now. It's it's pretty successful. I do enjoy managing it. There are times that I definitely don't. I don't like keeping up with the maintenance and doing all that, especially at a full-time job. Uh, it would be nice to have a property manager out here, but just because it's local, it's a drive away. It makes it 10 times easier to go see it. Uh, I'm about a five-minute drive away uh, versus something in Indiana where I would be uh, a flight away. So it's it's definitely something that, that you can manage locally. If you can manage it locally, I would definitely recommend it. Um, it would save you 8 to 12% in property management fees, um, and, and that's why I do it. Um, and if it's not taking too much of your time, I would totally go that route. But, yeah, right now I do still manage that property. I think from a scalability standpoint, um, I mean, let's say you had 10 or, tw- 10 or 20 doors locally, that might become a more of a full-time job, you know, for right. – Mint. Right. I would have to quit. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a financial analyst uh, at a winery out here in California. Um, so I do that for my full time job. So finance is what I do. Uh, so that's pretty much what I what I love about real estate. Right. Is that it, it checks all the boxes for something that I do on a daily basis, which is finance. Um, so it, that's what kind of attracts me to real estate. That's what attracts me to cash flow and different uh, different metrics to use to determine whether or not a real estate investment is successful. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, on a daily basis, I do finance for a living. What are what is the most attractive benefits financially of, of owning rental real estate? If we had to- um, the most attractive benefits, okay, you're building equity, which is huge. Um, you're also it's a secure investment, right? Over over the long term, usually real estate is pretty stable. Um, it usually goes up with appreciation, so you're getting that as well. Um, but at the end of the day, honestly, for, for rental income, you're looking for cash flow, right? You want to make sure that your, your income is greater than your expenses, which is what real estate can give you. Uh, and it's pretty reliable, really. Um, you can kind of rely on that to actually produce enough cash flow to cover your expenses, even with maintenance. Um, that's not something that you can get out of other investments where you kind of, if you put your money in the stock market, you don't know if it's going to go up or down, especially in the world that, as it is right now where the stock market's really high. You're more likely to go down than up at this point, which is what a lot of people believe, right? Real estate kind of gives you that stable investment that, that the stock market won't. You're, you know, you're a, you're a finance guy, and I know you like working with numbers, but what is your, why are you doing all this? You know, for per, you know, like personally, what yeah. inspires you to invest in real estate? We, we know it's a good financial asset. The name of the podcast kind of uh, stands out, or rent to retirement, right? So you want to rent to retire. Uh, so I think that, that, pretty much stands out to me. Um, so why am I doing this? I'm doing it for my parents. I'm doing it for myself. Uh, I'm doing it to leave my kids off better than, better than I was left off myself. So you kind of want to create that, um, that like little empire uh, pretty much. Uh, so I, I would probably say that it's, it's really just that peace of mind uh, that you're not relying on that day to day job or that, that paycheck, that weekly or monthly paycheck uh, to get by, right? You're, you're, Passive income is, is the way to go, really, and a lot of people have been successful over the years. Most people have been successful. Most people have become millionaires or billionaires through real estate. It's important to have a good why. You know, that's really the motivating factor. And, I mean, everyone we really work with, same same with us, we're, we're passionate. We're passionate about our lifestyle. We're passionate about our goals, where we want to be, leaving the, the world in a better place and our family in a better place than, um, than we were initially. And that's the great thing about real estate is you can create that generational wealth and the ability to to build that over time and that security. I, I love those answers. But let's just talk in, in a little bit greater depth about what was it that led you to choose to invest out of state, out of state specifically turnkey versus trying to do it on your own, and also kind of what led you to, to our team. Yeah, I think um, I think the Bigger Pockets podcast definitely led me to, to your team, right? I, I, led a, I read a lot of reviews around rental retirement and decided to go – uh, this route. I decided to go this route. I looked at other companies and decided that this route was the best for me. I saw the best cash flow. Uh, and I also met with, with you. Uh, and I, I thought you were a reliable guy. You're a guy that, that was really trustworthy. And that kind of, that kind of made me stay with rental retirement rather than go with another route. Right. Uh, other, other places kind of felt like it was more, uh, big corporate kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of turnkey where this kind of more felt like family-like, I want to say. It was just more personal, um, which is one thing that kind of like kept me uh, with rent to retirement. Um, but for the, for the most part, why, why I invested in real estate out of state was, hey, you got, I got priced out of the market. I couldn't afford it anymore. Uh, it was just, there was just no way that I can 
I can even possibly produce rental income or cash flow uh, by putting, I would have to put like maybe like a hundred thousand down on a home here uh, just to get one property. And that property wouldn't even cash flow. Right. Uh, that would produce maybe 1600 a month in rent. Uh, my cost would be about 1600 a month. And now I'm netting zero every month. Uh, it made no sense. Right. When uh, going out to the Midwest, I was seeing, Hey, you can produce $250 in cash flow. You can produce $300 in cash flow, $400 in cash flow. Uh, with just 20% down, and I was only putting 20 or 30k down. Uh, it just made way more sense financially, uh, and it allows you the ability to scale up, right? Like where I can put uh, 100,000 into one house and net no cash flow at all. I can put 20,000 into five houses and cash flow a thousand a month. Uh, it just made way more sense financially. From, from a financial analyst standpoint, it was a no-brainer. I resonate with what you're saying, George, because I'm in an expensive market here in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, too, and it's time to look outside of, out of the state to make your money work harder for you because – or work, work smarter, rather. It works really, really hard around here, but it doesn't it doesn't return much back. So, <laughs> yeah, you gotta you got to increase that velocity of return. I love it. And I get it. It's daunting. It's weird to think about investing in a property you're probably never going to visit or see across the country. I mean, can we talk a little bit about the – like emotional or, or mental blocks that you had to overcome, or maybe maybe you didn't, but what would you tell someone, you know, what challenges did you have, and what, what, what would you tell someone in your position as well that they're limited investing locally, they want to invest in real estate, so out-of-state is really their only option, and how do they get over that? Yeah, uh, I, I would say I had a ton of emotional blocks and a ton of barriers to actually going through with it. Um, everyone was calling me crazy for investing out-of-state. No, California is all you know. You should invest in, only in California. Well, the world's a big place, right? You can't just focus in on, on what you know. you got to focus in on what you don't know, too, and try to learn as much as you can about all the markets or about as much market as, – as many markets as you can, right? Honestly, it was, it was um, just the reviews itself that stood out to me. It was speaking with Uzak. It was speaking with the team. It was, it was kind of uh, building that trust, right? Uh, I built that trust well before – a month or two before that I actually committed to the property, right? And uh, even before then, even even before we actually started our working relationship, I reached out about a year before that just to learn more about rent to retirement. And we hopped on a call. It was like it was like 10, 15 minutes. But you were willing to hop on a call with me and discuss something without even me having to invest any money or put any money into into it right away. Right. We're, we're actually able to build that working relationship ahead of time. Um, and then once that time came around to me actually investing, uh, I kind of knew a little bit more about rent to retirement. I. I was more committed um, because I felt more, uh, I guess I, I felt more um, relaxed uh, in my, in my ability to invest just because I, I did do my studying. I did, I did my studying on the market. Uh, I did my studying on investing out of state. I read a lot of bigger pockets books and I figured that the positives definitely outweighed the challenges, better cash flow. You're priced out of the market here. There, there's just so many positives to list that, that it just made, made it a no brainer eventually. Uh, George, what are those two markets that are so uh, that are working so well right now? Uh, we're gonna, we're, gonna, for the we're gonna keep that on the hush hush. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so I would say uh, I keep telling Zach this. I was like, oh man, don't don't. I don't want to tell anybody about rent to retirement because it's it's killing it for me. But I have to. Uh, you guys have been so good to me, so I have to. Um, so I I gotta say uh, for me, Indiana has been an awesome uh, awesome state for me. I just I've just been seeing great results. Uh, out of out of all my properties in Indiana, uh, the property management company that I've been teamed up with in Indiana uh, has has been great. Um, and I, I want to say, like for for me personally, Indiana has stood out the most. Um, the other the other place I'm kind of uh, focusing in on more is Michigan. And and the reason why I focus in on Michigan is because I've been seeing uh, more cash flow out of those properties as well. You explained it better than I do to most people. I mean, it's just the fact that you. You diversify, you invest, and then you find out what works later. I mean, and, and that's where you want to focus your energy, absolutely. Um, but if you don't invest, you know, if you don't start, if you if you don't have a diversified portfolio, if you're just investing in one area, you would you wouldn't know otherwise. That's all you know. That's all your background is and and your exposure. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up here, George. We really appreciate you, you walking through your whole portfolio. Let's just kind of end on one topic. If there was someone that you were listening to this that was in, in your situation a year or two ago and they was thinking about it, but they're still hesitant. I mean, what is, what's some advice that you would tell that person on, 
you know, how to how to get over those mental blocks and and the reason the benefits to investing, you know, out of state in the area, in these different areas. Yeah, yeah. So as far as as far as getting over those roadblocks, I would probably say uh, do do your research, study. Um, the the reason why I say that is because if you don't study, you're kind of kind of left alone in the fog. You kind of can't see exactly where you're going. You got to kind of come in with a plan, right? So come in with that plan. Uh, study up on on real estate uh, out of state uh, and study up on the areas that you're about to invest in. And then, um, but you can't, you can't really ever see results unless you dive in, right? There's that analysis paralysis thing that people talk about constantly, right? Where you're constantly analyzing a deal. And uh, if you keep doing that, eventually you're going to miss out on that deal, right? Um, so you got to, you got to just dive in there. I, I know it's hard. It's, it's hard to do it. Um, but even in stocks, when you're deciding to put more money in your 401k or deciding to put more money uh, into a specific stock, you got to dive in to actually do that, right? Uh, it's the same thing. No nobody's nobody's going to become a millionaire overnight doing this, uh, especially the through cash flow and, and things like that. But uh, if you stick true to uh, your rules, you, tr- you stick true to what you've studied, um, you will. Uh, you will. As long as you actually just stick true to that and don't try to stray away from that and don't don't paralyze yourself through analysis. Um, you're you've got to make those decisions and kind of go for it uh, and dive right in. Um, I know it's hard to say that. Uh, it's easy to say that now, looking back, uh, in the beginning it wasn't, um, but that's that's just part of it, right? Anything that you do, you got to dive in. Going to college is, is scary at first, but once you dive in and you get out, all of a sudden you got that job that you wanted, or you got you got that paycheck that you wanted. And it's the same factor for anything in life, really. Uh, if you don't dive in, you're never going to see results. Um, so that's that's my biggest recommendation: just dive in. That's great. That's how you get that firsthand education. That's how you become a more experienced and confident investor is by investing. So, I mean, that's really the point of our company is to assist investors where you don't have to go out and do it on your own. We're here to offer them the mentorship and guidance to help people take bridge that gap and take that first step and ideally set yourself up for success and not have to make the same mistakes that so many, so many of us have, have made that can be very time consuming and expensive. So George, Wonderful interview. Thank you so much for your time. We're, you know, you're going to have a lot of competition in Indiana, I think, after this. But, um, no, really, truly appreciate your time. This has been a great interview, and I think will be very educational for everyone listening to it. So thank you again. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, George. Hey, Zach, another great interview today. Um, today we had on Alex Vieira based out of Santa Clara, California, Silicon Valley, a very expensive market, yet he's still able to make real estate investing work for him. He touched on some pretty cool things, including um, building generational wealth and uh, trying to be similar to his family members who invested in California back when it was a little bit cheaper, as well as uh, reclaiming some of his time and being able to do what he wants when he wants. Yeah, fantastic. I think that Alex touched on a lot of really good points. He's a young guy. Um, he's an electrician at 23 that's already, you know, well into, well onto his way of purchasing multiple rental properties in multiple markets and how that was not a limiting factor for him. Talked about a bunch of his peers that in, didn't, have not invested, took their money and just basically bought recreational toys and did other things that you know, basically has nothing to show for it. He took a different path where he decided to invest in real estate to support his lifestyle and support, you know, the stuff that he wanted to go out there and do. And I think that just speaks a lot to our listeners and the entrepreneurial mindset. So a lot of good stuff to cover. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. All right, everybody. Today we have Alex who's joining us from California. He is an investor that has closed one turnkey deal in Kansas City, Missouri, and currently under contract to close another. So Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking time out of your day to join us. Oh, of course. No, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you guys. Good deal. So we just want to go through and hear a little bit more about your personal experience going through purchasing for the first time out of state and kind of walk through those steps. So if you don't mind just starting off by giving us a little bit more information about yourself and kind of specifically what led up to the decision to invest in rental real estate, that would be fantastic. Yeah, of course. So I'm currently 23 years old. I'm an electrician here in the Silicon Valley. I took a look at family, friends, and my great aunts and uncles that all own properties here in the Silicon Valley. 
And I've seen how well they've been able to do it for themselves, investing in real estate. So I've always known pretty much my whole life that real estate is a great option to build wealth long term. Currently, with the way prices are here in the Silicon Valley, it's the numbers just don't make sense. It's not worth investing. So I did learn about markets outside of the, the California and the great returns that you can get. And I had stumbled across rent to retirement on uh, bigger pockets. So I looked at your guys' inventory and was actually really pleased with what I was seeing. And uh, some of the things that I was hesitant about with purchasing out of state was the condition of the properties and finding property managers. And it was just a lot to think about. And when I found rent to retirement, I realized this is a one-stop shop. I can build a relationship with you. You helped me find a lender. And it just made everything just really start rolling that's that's great i think that you know and you you've never seen any of these properties right a lot of people i think have a challenge with that that's a mental obstacle is getting over the fact of not not seeing these houses in person when you buy them that's a weird concept yeah i think it's it's key to remove the emotional aspect in the purchase you know a lot of people are comfortable with buying stocks and mutual funds and whatnot they don't know the the ceo of the companies they don't know sometimes they don't even know what products the company that owns those stocks, you know, creates. So real estate is just another investment. You can't make it an emotional buy. It has to be for investment. You're purchasing houses. You're not purchasing a home for yourself. It's key to remove the emotional aspects so you can focus on the numbers and build the long-term wealth. I love it. Love it, dude. That's great. Um, so you mentioned your your family members and everybody who's who's done well for themselves. You know, what are their lives like that that you might admire, or what is your biggest why for getting into real estate in the first place? Yeah, so most of my family that owns the real estate, they're my great aunts and uncles. So they're getting into their seventies and eighties. They were mostly dairy farmers. You know, they didn't really make a lot of money at work, but what they did do with their money was smart. They saved a lot of their money and they invested in real estate. Now. Whether or not they saw the huge benefits of this boom or not that we've had here in California, that's generational wealth. I mean, their kids, their kids' kids are, they're set for life because of that investment they made back 40, 50 years ago. So that's what I've seen. If I could build a solid portfolio, it's not just for me. It's every other family member down the line that can benefit off of it. That's great. It's about the amount of money that you keep and how you how you use your money, because we exactly. all have people that make really good money and they got nothing to show for it besides you know beyond a bunch of toys or whatever you know and that's mm-hmm. it's that lifestyle creep where they start to make really good money and then they start to increase the you know the cost of living, um, you know and it's just this repeated cycle and that can disappear at any point in time. But you talk right. about wealth and some family members that just made some smart moves over time and. And what you know, how that's created a lifestyle for themselves and and future generations. What's kind of the long-term goal? Where do you see yourself with real estate investing? You know, in the short term and the long term. What's the end goal here? Yeah, so I guess I wouldn't necessarily call it short term, but the shorter term is I really want to um, invest. I really want to get to like a 10, 10 unit um, portfolio. And I want to be able to use real estate investing to help me afford a property here in the Bay Area someday. You know, I guess it's kind of unfortunate that I really love living here, you know, with how expensive things are. But I know that if I make the proper investments and I'm smart with my money, I can easily afford to live here. Even though I may not make the high tech salary, I still make a good living at work, which I could even maximize with if I make the proper investments to be able to live here. Very cool. Yeah, with the expensive market you're in, I mean, the out of state is kind of a obvious choice. But um, mm-hmm. you know, what led to to building that um, comfort level to actually take take the leap, um, and then why you know rent to retirement over other strategies or uh, choosing another provider? Because there are a lot of people that will open the door for you. Yeah, you know, ever since my first initial conversation with Zach, I knew that this was going to be a great company to work with. I looked at the Bigger Pockets reviews and the countless amount of people that have invested with rent to retirement are happy. I'm totally comfortable with doing so. And I mean, I think one of the greatest parts is like, you know, I find a property on the inventory list that I like. I reach out to Zach, say I want to put it under contract, and I get and right into an email thread with the property manager, the agent the title people. I mean, it's the most comfortable way that I could see purchasing a house out of state if you don't want to take it full time and 
fly out there and get a team together. It's been super comfortable. And, you know, I was pretty concerned about the lending. I didn't really know where to start. I've never financed anything before in my life. The moment Zach had uh, hooked me up with Highlands Residential Mortgage and I talked to the guys over there, it couldn't have been an easier process. This whole process has been so much easier than I, I think most people realize it actually is. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Sometimes it's overwhelming. It's daunting, especially when you're talking about investing in real estate for the first time or the first time out of state. You don't know where to start. There's so many working parts, you know what I mean? And you really, you're building a business when you're building a rental portfolio. And so you, so you need all the right, the right people in place from a lending, uh, you know, the accounting, the legal, you need all of these people to assist with all aspects it requires to build this, you know, successful, sustainable business model. And that's truly what we try to bring to the table and the value we try to provide to our investors is the ability to tap into that immediate network. We're all full-time investors that have been successful in real estate and, and rightfully so because of the same strategies we work with our investors on and, and having all the right people in place. And so sometimes there's a lot of working parts, but so, yeah, you just got to break it down step by step and, you know, have the right people to kind of mentor and guide you through that process. Um, so I appreciate that. Let's talk a little bit more about your specific experience. Can you talk about the properties that the, the one you have on your belt, the one you're purchasing now? And you don't have to be super specific about this, but maybe just talk about general locations. I know a lot of people are going to be curious about the numbers. You know, what, what were the home purchase price? What were we looking in terms of cash flow, return, markets you're in and, and why? Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, of course. So uh, the first one that I purchased in Kansas City was uh, listed at seventy nine thousand. So the twenty percent down payment was about sixteen thousand. After closing costs, I was actually under twenty thousand dollars of my own cash into this deal. My cash flow every month is just under two hundred and eighty dollars a month, which is actually more than what was listed on the inventory website because of interest rates being lower now than what's estimated in the calculations, but I know when I was first getting into this, a lot of people were saying, t- telling me like, oh, those numbers, you know, they're kind of, you know, they're on the higher end of things. And learning from experience, it's spot on, if not e- even better when you actually step into the deal, you know. A lot of people get stuck in the analysis paralysis part. And like, once you actually step into it and get your, your feet wet, I mean, it's... It's definitely good. Yeah, the second property that I just put under contract is a little bit more expensive, a um, little bit higher return though, a little bit more cash flow. So it it all it's all working out. Yeah, that's great. And and as you know, I'm sure I mean we've had this multiple discussion that not everything works out in real estate 100% correctly like you anticipate. Um, you know, but if you have a systematic approach to make sure you're controlling a lot of those variables. There's, there's a high likelihood that, you know, these rental properties are going to be successful and work out like you anticipate, but that's why it's important to have a portfolio of multiple streams of income, the 80% rule where you have, or the 80-20 rule where, you know, if you own enough doors over a long enough period of time, you're going to have properties that are not operating appropriately or, you know, not meeting those returns. You're going to have some properties that far exceed your expectations, yeah. but it all balances out over time. And that's why it's important to have multiple streams of income. Exactly. Yeah. And I know one of the key things, like I know I only have one property under my belt now. Um, I'm not taking that cash flow and just using it to increase my lifestyle. I have all my cash flow going into a whole different bank account. I don't even have a debit card for it. I'm just keeping that all separate to help build that account more for future maintenance, future vacancies, and just to continue growing that account for any of those issues that may come on down the road. I'm not going to have to pull out of my own savings account towards the next property in the future to fix those issues in the other ones. So I like to keep everything separate. Uh, it just keeps it more responsible on my end. Yeah, that's so smart. You kind of have to like hide. You got to hide it from yourself. It can be too yeah. tempting. Even a savings account, it's just one transfer away. You know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. For sure. So yeah, obviously you you've really trained your brain to look down the road a lot and look to the long term and you know, mentioning that multi-generational wealth, you know, you have one property closed and another property under contract. What kind of frequency do you think you're going to be investing? Do you have a a goal of a couple properties a year, uh, you know, exponential growth? What's to come five to 10 years from now? Yeah. So uh, five months ago is when I closed on my first one. So I want to say about if we can close on this next one in 45 to 60 days, that would be about seven to eight months apart. I'd really like to buy two, maybe even three in 2021. 
Um, that's my goal. My long-term goal is in five years, I want to have 10 properties. I'm not really too considered about the doors. I just want to have 10 deals under my belt within the next five years to really get my cash flow going and build a more stable portfolio so that I can get into bigger deals using things like 1031 exchanges or things like that to help even increase my wealth. That's great. Alex, can we talk a little bit about obstacles that maybe prevented you from getting started sooner or issues that you had, you know, whether it's emotional, financial, or just obstacles throughout the process of of buying these first couple? In the very, very beginning, I definitely was pretty concerned about like, oh, does the house have a garage or oh, three bed, two bath, you know, things like that when I really did not need to worry about those things, you know. It's it's not a criteria of mine that is really going to affect me. What affects me is the numbers. Everything was very smooth with the first purchase. Um, I've had a couple other properties that I put them under contract and I find out that the rehab is going to take a little longer. Not necessarily fault of your guys', just because of the whole COVID situation. I mean, that make, that doesn't make anything easy on anybody. I went with a property that was ready to go. There was no rehab that needed to get done to it. That was really the only hiccup. Um, Everything has been super comfortable, super straightforward. Everybody that I've worked with as far as the title companies, the lenders, the closing agents, and I mean, even the uh, the mobile notary that came to me and uh, did the closing paperwork, I mean, he was astonished with the idea of out-of-state investing, and I even passed along the idea to him. So it, it's it's just been a great opportunity, great learning experience that I don't think a lot of people are taking advantage of. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, it really can all be done remotely now. Look at what we're doing right now, producing yep. some content from three different states. I love it. Cool. So now, Alex, now that you've gotten started and other people are interested in doing something like you, what advice would you give investors that are looking to get started? You know, I read some of the real estate books from Bigger Pockets, but I didn't really focus too much on learning every single aspect of the real estate game. You know, a lot of people get so focused on not having the knowledge. I think they forget that the knowledge isn't anything unless it's applied. So I'm not one that tends to learn from just reading books and stuff. I learn from experiences. I think the biggest thing is just if you have the financial capabilities of getting into a real estate investment, go for it and don't be scared. You know, it's it's a very stable investment and there's great people and great information that can help you along the way. I love that. Just that, that applied knowledge, you know, because so many people get stuck in the analysis process, right? They're reading oh, yeah. everything. They want to analyze everything. It's like years go by and they just didn't take action. And, and that's just years of education and, you know, growth of, of income and equity, all everything over time. Did you ever have, could you have some family with background in real estate, some family not? Is there anyone that told you, Alex, you're making a mistake. You're doing it wrong. Like, what are you doing investing out of state? That's a terrible idea. Yeah. I mean, my parents are not like my aunts and uncles. They're very conservative with money. So it's definitely been a thing where I don't really say tell them too much. They know that I'm being responsible with my money as far as I'm not dumping every penny into this investment. You know, I still have my savings account, a nice cushion to where I can make these investments. And worst case scenario, if the properties go vacant, need major maintenance, I'm still okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get flipped over here or be in a very bad financial position. Excellent. Yeah, you're, you're, you have reserves, you know, and that's, that's important too. You know, the bank's going to require you to have enough reserves. You need to have mm-hmm. reserves for life, you know, just rainy day, but, but you save oh, yeah. expendable income to, to go in and reinvest. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier about peers you have or people, you know, that are just, taking that that extra money and just blowing it on toys you know and we literally in the last interview we had we're talking about buying assets to support your lifestyle and support your toys you buy the asset first you know and use that to support the the toys and the recreation so we absolutely love that so um sam anything else before we wrap this up here yeah not a lot but um alex thanks for joining us and i'm a young guy like you with a really similar timeline on our on our investing goals so Awesome. Um, I'll shoot you an email after we can stay in touch because I'd love to uh, riff off each other going forward. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and uh, link up and we can talk real estate. That'd be great. Love it. Awesome. Alex, thank you so much again for taking time out of your day. I think this will be very beneficial for a lot of people who are probably in your position and want to take that first step to get started. So, again, lots of good nuggets of knowledge here. Thanks for your time. Of course. You guys take care.
Thanks, Alex. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Rent to Retirement Podcast, your number one resource for wealth building, real estate investing, and stress free retirement strategies. Continue your real estate education and invest with us at renttoretirement.com.